everybody. I think this is a, uh, it's a great session. I love tech priorities. I love talking about what it is that we have planned. And, um, and I think it's kind of funny because as I think about tech priorities, you want to think about innovation. You want to think about great growth things that we're doing. And I look at our current situation. We have crazy inflation. We have geopolitical issues. We have supply chain things. We hear about ESG all the time. We're hearing about what we have to do for risk management and residual risk management. And then there's innovation, right? And all of these things are a trade-off. So we have this subtitle about everything in moderation. And I think that uh, this is an interesting story for us. What are really our tech priorities and how do we trade all of these off? So I think it will be a very good discussion today. So thank you three for, for joining here. And um, I thought maybe what we would start with is just to ask each of you what it is that you do for, in your respective roles. And maybe just as you talk about what you do, uh, what are the, just if you had to pick three things, what are your top three tech priorities, at least for 2023? So I'll start with you, Jeff. You're uh, the man of all innovation for, for, for EY. And tell us a little bit about what you do. And if you had to pick three things, what would they be? So uh, hello, <coughs> I'm Jeff. Oh, bless you. Thank you. I'm the Global Chief Innovation Officer for EY. Uh, EY, I think most of you probably know who we are, but we are 300 and 65,000 person, although that was the last official number we announced. The number is actually a little bigger than that. Uh, professional services firm. Uh, we touch every major country, pretty much every major city around the world in what we do. And my job there, I, I like to say it very simply, is to create new. So that <coughs> might be new ways we're looking at the old things that we've done for a long time or some of the new things that we want to do as we look going forward. Um, as a part of that, I run the Innovation Network internally, which is our little secret competitive advantage because we have a quarter million, over a quarter million clients around the world that we hear from about what they're spending money on and what they're doing. Uh, we invest in-, in You're gonna tell us all now and lose the competitive advantage. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna let you all have that insight and knowledge. Um, we do, we, do uh, an, uh, we invest out of a global investment pool on internal projects because we have some conflicts when we invest outside because we're a regulated business. Um, and then I own the global labs and this is, gets to our priorities. So I own okay. four global labs and these are the technologies that we name that we think are important to us. So they're easy and they're very common. Artificial intelligence, blockchain, Web3 slash metaverse, which we know is highly related to the blockchain team, uh, but they do slightly different things. Mm -hmm. And then quantum computing. And what I'll say is we, we can get deeper into each of those technologies and why, but each of them have their own moment in terms of their relevance and importance to us and their relevance and importance to our customers and clients. And that's why we focus across the board. It's sort of we have to take the portfolio approach as we think through where we need to focus and be intentional because each one will be important to different industries at different times. Okay. So Laura, I'm very curious if you are aligned. Laura is the Chief Customer Officer for ServiceNow. Tell us a little bit about what you do and, uh, and what your top three would be. Yeah, um, so thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm Laura Kamey. I, I, um, I've been at ServiceNow for about um, five and a half years and ServiceNow is about, you know, it depends on the stock market today, but around a hundred billion dollar market cap software enterprise software company that um, drives you know automated workflows. And so, um, <clears throat> I started out as the chief strategy officer and moved into this role about two and a half years ago, where I run everything that's post sales for our uh, for our customers and the company, which includes professional services. Um, our customer success, our ecosystem training, and, and for a while I was also running our entire uh, partner ecosystem. Um, and so um, I'm very much about what, you know, w when I think about the, the priorities right now for ServiceNow and for, uh, you know, what we're talking about in the C-suite, um, and then for my business, you know, the first is that this is a, as, as you guys all know, the uh, temperatures change. I'm also on the board of Confluent, which is a you know um, a, a software company that, that went public um, I think two years ago now, and um, it's it's you know it's a different uh, economic time and a different kind of investor sentiment where it's not growth at all costs. It's it's a balance of growth and profitability, and 
and that um, that set of muscles is is actually different from what, for what a lot of our employees are used to. You know, it, since we've had such a long uh, bull market, and so there's a lot of conversations, uh, you know, going on around what are those trade-offs? How do you get more, you know, operationally rigorous and um, and and pulling some of that good. You know, I spent 17 years at Bain and Company as a consultant um, for software companies, and it's kind of like the work that I did. But it's 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 a little bit of a new muscle for a lot of folks, and so that is one big conversation. And it also pivots to how we position ourselves for our customers because it's not, you know, our our software can drive a lot of efficiency, a lot of automation, but there's still a digital transformation agenda going on for customers. And so how do you position both of those things? Because that, you know, you, you can't stop the digital transformation journey. So I think that's, you know, that's kind of one thing. It's just, you know, what conversations you have with your customers and also in the C-suite in terms of how do you think about your own business priorities. The second, because I'm the chief customer officer, I have to, I have to talk about customer experience. And I, and I do think that um, you never waste a good crisis, and I think uh, tough macroeconomic times are times where customer loyalty can be won or lost, and you can really differentiate yourself. And so I think there's a lot of rich discussion in what that means and how you show up for your customers and what, as a software company, you have to do to drive that. So happy to, to talk about that a little bit more. And then the last thing I would say is, you know, it's easy in the software world to, to, to look at all of the, you know, um, talk of layoffs and, and everything that's happening as we drive to more of this efficiency. But if you think about the economy more broadly, there absolutely still is an opportunity skills gap, right? And digital skills are more in demand than ever. Um, and, you know, I run, uh, we think about <clears throat> not just what we need at ServiceNow in terms of employees to grow, but also what we need across the ecosystem for our customers and in our partners. And there's a massive gap, you know, in skills. And so how do we think about what's required there and how do we build out that ecosystem of talent and reskill folks in a way that we can uh, meet the demands for where the business is going. So those are sort of three things that are, uh, that are part of our conversations. Yeah, that's good stuff. <clears throat> Alex, I don't, I'm not even gonna try to describe your role, so you just run <laughs> over 80% of Qualcomm. Am I allowed to just put it that way? Um, so sure, sure. tell us a little bit about what you do and what are your top three? Sure. Um, so Qualcomm, if you ha haven't heard of us, uh, we're the connected processor company for the Intelligent Edge. And uh, we concentrate in lead in technologies that allow digital transformation and growth. Um, and we bring new user experiences for that growth uh, in, that, in that digital economy. And my organization in particular concentrates on personal devices that people carry. So smartphones, personal computers, tablets, XR in terms of uh, VR and AR devices, wearable devices, hearable devices, gaming devices. Uh, so it's all personal smart devices in, in, in this industry. And um, if, you, if you think about it, uh, if, if, you, if you believe that cloud computing is like an infinite growth, where everything is getting processed and, and you know, there's, a, there's a lot of intelligence happening, you must also believe that the billions of devices that are existing on an intelligent edge are fueling that growth. And that also has infinite growth potential. And so any device that is gonna exist, that's gonna be useful to you in the future, has to be connected. And it also has to be able to do processing in, in, in terms of high performance processing in low power states. And be able to have intelligence to understand the data and be able to give you something that's useful in the user experience. So the three areas that are very, very important to us that are the backbone of, of the, the digital transformation of these industries is wireless connectivity. You have to have connectivity everywhere. You have to have um, capability to process on the device itself, again, at low power, because these devices are, are battery powered, and sometimes they're in sitting in a place like a, like a Internet of Things type of a device is sitting in place for years, and you don't want to go dig things up and try to replace batteries on them. So they have to operate in low power, and they have to have on-device intelligence. So wireless connectivity, processing 
on the device at low power states with AI capability on the device are extremely important. And that expands itself into not only personal devices that you carry with you, but the automotive industry, industrial IoT devices, manufacturing plants, uh, retail plants and shops, and how they want to transform themselves into the digital age and bring on these new user experiences will all benefit from the technologies that we concentrate on. And the processing, we could go on forever. There's CPUs and GPUs and audio capability and video capability and camera capability, all of those combine into processing mm -hmm. in high performance capability in low power states. So those are, the, those are the major three areas that we concentrate on. Having come from the telecom and cable industry myself, you know, I, I relate to all of those, uh, those things very closely. Yes. Yes. But I look at, at, at uh, you know, this particular event and it's one of my favorite to come to every year and, and you know, we have a whole bunch of innovators, entrepreneurs, investors, everybody's thinking, am I invested in the right place? Am I investing in the right place? You know, am I doing the right things? And uh, so, so I looked up Gardner's top 10 priorities for, two, for, for, for this year, right, for 23. And I wrote down all of yours and I thought, oh, I'm gonna compare, right? <laughs> because can we have a really good cheat sheet that we can walk away here with? So, um, Digital immune system, applied observability, AI, trust, risk management, cloud platforms, industry cloud platforms, platform engineering, wireless value realization, super apps, adaptive AI, metaverse, which would include your Web3, let's put those together, and sustainable technology. So I think uh, it's not it's not that different. There's a lot of overlap yeah, there, which lot. is pretty good, right? Yeah. So, and I didn't know what they were gonna say, so I was just curious myself as to how much would overlap. But there's one thing, Laura, that you said that really, that really sticks with me, this whole customer focus, right? So let's put aside tech for the side of tech, and, and, and uh, you know, I have an engineering background, so I like it for the sake of just tech, you know? We can dive deep and everyone will be bored to tears. But what you said is really, uh, is really, uh, impactful, right? You take that customer side and customer first, uh, increasing talent and, and, and what it is that we can do. Can you just talk a little bit more about? Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the criticality of customer experience. And so, you know, I think we all know the data, right? You know, and NPS is one of the most acceptable, you know, sort of measurements of customer experience. We know it correlates with all things that are good. We know promoters grow two times faster than detractors. We know that, you know, if you have promoters, they renew at higher rates, they expand at higher rates, all of the good things that software companies care about. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, the opportunity is to, how do you make that not just a functional job, right? Like, it shouldn't just be my job as the, as the post-sales function, but how do you make that core to your company's value and core to kind of every employee's job? Because every function actually plays a role. If you, if you really map out the customer journey, every single function plays a role in that, whether you're, you know, in facilities and what does it feel like when, you, when, you know, a customer comes into your, you know, briefing center or into your offices. You know, um, what, of course, the, you know, for us, it, we, we use the, we kind of did the acid test of like delightful, frictionless, and valuable, right? And if you kind of think about everything, every kind of touch point with a customer, those, those actually are pretty good asset tests, I think, for, for how a software company should think about it. So I even talked to our legal team and it's like, okay, guys, like, how do we think totally differently about this? Not, not the way it's been done or the way every software company does it, but like, what if we had, you know, one click contracting? Mm. Like, how awesome would that be? Yeah. Like, what a great, delightful customer, frictionless and delightful customer experience that would yeah. be. And so I think there's, there's, you know, a real opportunity there. The other, the other side is valuable, which, you know, when we talk about um, what our messaging is and what we're innovating, or, like, what does that mean for customers in terms of their business value, in terms of what their priorities and what they're trying to drive, which everybody knows that kind of transition for a company and, and how do you train your sales force to actually have those conversations is incredibly meaningful. So for example, if we were partnering with, with Qualcomm and we, you know, you, the customer was driving a lot of you know, IoT on the edge and, and trying to go through that transformation. It's like, well, what are you going to do with that data? Like, what, 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 what efficiencies can you drive internally? And so what, what you know, 
data and insight can you drive from that? And then how do you trigger automated workflow to actually get OpEx out of your company or to actually create a better customer experience, mm -hmm. right? And so how do you transition what they care about in translate what, what your software does or what your business does into what they actually care about and what's driving their top and bottom line? So I could speak all day on customer experience, but I think you know in this time in particular, it really is an opportunity to differentiate from the crowd and show up differently because you have the empathy um, and, and you are partners side by side with the customer to try to solve problems for them. I have to say you are definitely uh, fabulous at all of these. Seeing something, automating it, putting it into a workflow, I mean, that's what you do really, really well. And, uh, and I'm seeing a lot of innovation and a lot of startups in not training, but people uplifting, right? Being able to train and have that in, in, in a useful environment and have that really help up, uplift a company, sell more growth of product, a whole different way of innovating. So yeah. it's been fascinating to watch that. Um, uh, Jeff, I'm going to shift to you because you gave this very succinct, uh, uh, very succinct answers that very much aligned kind of with the uh, you know top priorities. So when you help companies and you and, and you go, uh, it, how much are you pushing for the technology and the trade-off versus all of the other things like their customer experience, their growth, and, and et cetera? You know, it's really interesting that you you started with customer because I think that that's absolutely the right place to start. You know, when you think about sort of this room with a series of investors and startups in the same room, I think most people in here recognize that there's a hype cycle going on with a lot of different technologies. And I find the hype cycle is oftentimes built on thinking from the technology first out. Right. Right. So generative AI, very popular right now, amazing stuff. And everyone goes to the imagination of what's possible. So it rides a hype cycle of, look at all these things that are going to be different in the world. This is amazing. It's all going to be different. And it's all going to change, um, which is fantastic. And I love that part of the imagination. But the real place that you have to pay attention to is what, uh, this is my verbiage on this, um, the reality curve, right? Where are customers actually spending money? What problems are you actually solving? So when we go to customers, we don't say, hey, here's some AI, take it, right? We go and say, hey, we think we can solve this problem in a new and different way because now we have these amazing technologies and tools that we didn't have five years ago. Mm -hmm. And so really everything for us starts with that reality curve, starting with what are customers actually spending money on, what are the problems they're trying to solve, and then working backwards from there. Even though oftentimes you're right, we'll talk about things from the technology out because we love the promise of it as well. So that's where I think really focusing on customer first is really the most important thing. And for us, as I said, to, that's our unique advantage is because we see so many customers of different sizes that we know what everybody's doing in terms of spending money on for us to help them transform, but also the influence of what they, what they actually spend money on uh, outside of that. I mean, I think you're spot on. I do think that uh, it's well known that, that, that competition now is on brand, loyalty, customer first, as opposed to coolest tech. And, and so, uh, so, so even though I enjoy the, the technical conversations, I think uh, what's the purpose and, and, and what's the outcome? I have to say, if we were here a year ago, I'd have to just say the word cryptocurrency, and we'd all do a check mark. But now, since we're here this year, I have to say chat GPT. I said it, check mark, we're good. Um, I do think that it's, it's so here right now, generative AI, chat GPT, it's come up in every session. And uh, uh, I think we all laugh at it a little bit because it's just today's, it's just today's topic. But on a very serious note, um, AI, uh, I, I've been in the field for, for, for many, many years. Uh, I don't want to say how long because then I'll seem old. But I know for sure that Qualcomm is heavily invested in AI for a very long time as well. And so on a, a what does this mean for 5G? What does it mean for our future? Again, this customer first. Do you, can you just tell us a little bit about your AI investment? And yes. So you can say ChatGPT too. And just I, can, I will say ChatGPT. <laughs> Check. Check. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so uh, Qualcomm has been invested in AI for over 10 years now. And, and you know, we started in research and development and then moved the innovations into the product category where actually user experiences could be realized. And talking about customer first, um, 
what we do um, for the past few years has been forever Qualcomm's been concentrating on technology, technology, technology. And then what happened was we quickly realized that some of our customers don't even know what to do with the technology unless we show user experiences that actually matter, meaning that people will actually use it on, on a daily basis. And, um, and, and when, you, when you dive into technicalities, the consumer usually gets lost. They just want to understand what the use case is and how it helps them on a daily basis. So without adding anything to our um, cost of our products, we first try to figure out what the user experience is going to be and try to work our way backwards, which is so important for us to be involved, for example, with our customers and their customers. We're, Qualcomm, as a, as a chipset and software supplier, we're two or three steps removed from the consumer. So we need to understand right. that chain completely to understand what is it that's going to drive the customer to sell something and the consumer to say, I would like to buy that product. So we try to understand that chain from, from that end backwards to how we implement the technology. But from an AI perspective, let me, let me give you an example. So these, the AI models and the capabilities have been around, around for so long. And AI and the devices that you carry today are, are very, very relevant. So for example, in, in a phone, the camera capability on these phones has, have become so good. It can take a picture in any type of light, low light, big sunlight, dark, any, any picture. It can capture a moment in best clarity. Even if you're capturing a moving image, it'll snap you know, 15 shots and pick the best one for you. What's doing all that? It's all embedded AI. Mm. Um, so security, like let's say you have a rogue uh, cellular base station that's trying to hack your phone. We can detect and figure out what to do. Personal assistance, you tell your phone what to do. It does it, does it for you. How does it know? It's all built in AI. But people don't realize because it's all working in the background. And now for the first time, when you see the power of, of a chat GPT in a search environment, and you see a generative AI in, for example, building an image that's in your mind that no one else knows. It's the first time image that's coming out that's going to be your image that you told this phone or a device or a PC to make, and it made it for you. Then people now can touch and feel AI, and they will make their decision buying criteria based on not just the CPU speed or how fast the game runs or how, much, how long the battery lasts, but they'll also have another criteria called what does the AI function do for me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's now actually touch and feel for the consumer side. They can understand why AI is so important for them. I know, Alex, but I still feel that, that from a, a general consumer perspective, when now people see the power in something that we, on a technology level, have known for a, a very, very long time, yeah. and uh, and we've we're very comfortable working with, um, I think people are scared of it, and I think that you see a lot of fear. So on this customer experience and customer first perspective, I think part of it is to every everything's going to have AI in it, right? Every, every piece of technology, customer experience but I think we still have a, a, a bit of a, a way to go to just market it maybe the right way to, to, to accept the fact that this is a good thing and, and, and make sure that we put the right boundaries to keep that Absolutely. A, 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 that way as well. It's true, not only companies like Qualcomm, but everyone who is, is involved in AI, especially big internet companies that are, that are pushing these types of capabilities, have the responsibility to show how it can be used for good and how it can what are the mechanisms in place to prevent something bad from happening? Mm -hmm. And how do you catch that before it happens? Mm -hmm. And so we all have that responsibility, but I'll tell you, the, these models are going after people creating things, you know, uh, enhancing their, their, their papers, enhancing their presentations, creating models, creating images that has never been there before. So they're going after the creator model, whether it's a consumer or an enterprise worker, they're all gonna be concentrating on trying to make something a lot more creative than what it was before. And yes, you're absolutely right. We all have the responsibility to show how we can manage this from going bad. And yeah. I'd, I'd say that it, it's interesting because you described it at the consumer level, but I do think that that applies equally to the enterprise level. Yes. Yes. Companies yes. are, looking at this as an opportunity, they're looking at this as what are the limitations and what are the regulatory yeah. frameworks that are going to come 
around generative AI and how do they think about it. So when we do AI work now, actually, and particularly when we're, we're getting a lot of inquiries about generative AI, so we're doing a lot of that right now, um, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of discussions, and this is usually you know, CEO and boards around, you know, what are the opportunities do I have? What new markets can I enter? How can I take costs out of the system? But equally, it's the legal risk, those, the, those groups who are saying, wait a second, what, what are the companies we're interacting with? What are the value systems of those companies, the mission of those companies? Do they align with our values because they know this technology is so powerful and go in so many directions that they want to be sure that the roadmap ahead is also something that they can be philosophically aligned with? So yeah. Jeff, I, I'm on a lot of public and private boards, and so I spend a lot of time, I, I, I uh, chair a risk committee, and, uh, and, and, and Everything is about quantifying risk, quantifying cyber risk, quantifying residual risk, and how do, how do we have transparency on risk and compliance and, and, and more. And then when we stop and talk about innovation, we turn around the next day and talk about risk again. So risk is, is, is uh, in, in, in our everyday lives. I'd just like to know from each of you, actually, what's your risk versus innovation trade-off? Because it's great to talk about all this, but but then, as you just said with the AI example, right? It, it, every topic and in innovation turns around quickly to a risk discussion. Yeah. Can, you, can each of you maybe yeah. touch on that for us? It's well, let, yeah, let me start and, and you know, part, so ServiceNow is an enterprise company. We sell to the biggest corporations in the world. So risk is absolutely critical and, and we have our own data centers. We don't, we largely aren't in public cloud. And so it's foundational to the way we've been, our, you know, architected is, you know, maintaining, uh, helping to control and audit and understand customer risk in such a way that we're protecting the data that runs through our system. And so it's a big deal when we talk about the trade-off for innovation because we have existing customer contracts, we have a, you know, a, a huge installed base and limitations as you think about the new innovations in AI, et cetera. You know, where can you commingle data? Where can you not? What are the rules around that? Is How it a trade-off, or do you integrate those <coughs> two to make your innovation have? Inherent? Well, it starts to be a trade. It starts to be a trade-off because the legal rules are are you know black and white. But okay. then the question is, okay, based on the customer benefit, if we think about this differently, if we're trying to leverage some of this technology, what do we have to do? What does that mean in terms of the customer conversations? The amount of risk that we can control that we can't control. And how do you take customers on that journey? Because it's not just a, oh, we can flip a switch and turn it on. You know, when you have a large installed base, you have to work on that over time. So, you know, to me, it's a, um, it, it's not as easy as just talking about the trade-offs because you actually have to bring, for us anyway, bring the customer along that journey. So, it, so it actually isn't a an overnight decision. I think we <clears throat> all have to embed it in our strategy. It has to yeah. be one. One to, you know, it, like you said, may start it as two conversations, but that's not where it can yeah. end. So What's what, your what we do, and I'll, I'll, I'll make it, the, the, the ideas, Larry, you had uh, tangible for us. So take generative AI, specifically ChatGPT. Um, we put out a specific document, uh, a specific set of instructions of how our employees can and cannot use ChatGPT in the line of work, and it was, it was relatively conservative, right? You can't put private data inside of there. You can't ask queries about company, uh, the companies we serve inside of it because we didn't know where the data was going. So that's the way we manage risk, sort of the explosive risk of this is being used in an unmanaged way throughout the entire firm. On the flip side, what we, what we have created are sandboxes around which we can actually do a whole series of experiments. So there's a yeah. whole series of efforts right now those will go up by five or ten x by, you know, six months yeah. from now, um, and what we're trying to do is make sure that when we do run these experiments and are innovative, we do it in a way where we can observe it, we can observe the results, we can be very clear with clients that are on the other side of it that hey, we're running this experiment, you see it, you approve it, you know what's going on, and internally that we know we're we're treating our data privacy correctly which I think is an important part when we're talking about generative. So it's really for us about splitting and making sure we are as excited as anybody about what this could mean. We encourage everybody to experiment with this technology, try it out, try it out on your own, write a song in the form of Beyonce, right, about inflation, which is something I love to do. Um, <laughs> and then on the other side, though, we, we make sure there's an area that we can do these experiments where the rules are clear, the clients are clear, the customers are clear about what we're doing. Yeah. 
Yeah, we follow exactly the same rules, like uh, restricting chat GPT for documents that cannot be public and things like that. So they started showing up all of a sudden. So we, we started restricting that. But um, furthermore, I think what we do is uh, within, within the chip, within the semiconductor, we have secure enclaves, mm -hmm. we have secure processing, we have areas in memory where no one can access besides the user. So we've embedded all of those things and we, we've worked with big internet companies like Google, Microsoft, um, you know, a lot of the, our, our OEM partners um, to understand how they can make their users secure, identity-wise or even at, against attacks. And so we work with all of these different entities, including developers in the market on security and how to make things more private, um, keep that privacy, uh, and keep the security for your personal data in, in such a way that it doesn't get um, hacked at all. It's like impossible. You would have to break the device and break the chip and it won't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So the only person who, have, who has access to it is you. There are key, software keys that we, we very, very protect very uh, vigorously. And so we learn from our partners how to make things more secure and, and better. And um, the, the thing that we cannot control is the developer community that has access to open APIs and can develop anything on top of um, a technology that's out there. But as far as controlling our own products and protecting our customers and some of their customers from, from, um, from having such violations, we, we take those measures. Mm -hmm. All three of your answers were lovely, but I'm sure all of you are still losing sleep over uh, yeah, whatever's absolutely. coming up tomorrow. Absolutely. So the, the, next the one innovation yeah. that's safe exactly. is anything risk related. Yeah. Where it's, you have a You're long only life. as good as the next hack. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. It's tough. Um, I'm gonna, I, I wanna just shift for a little bit. And, and one of the things, I've worked for very large companies, I've worked for very small companies. And, uh, and one of the things when, when uh, I ran a very, very large business, I realized that um, it's, it's harder to innovate. It's harder to have these tech priorities because the priorities are making growth in my business, right? So it was very, very focused. And, uh, and so I, I realized I really needed small companies and, and I needed small companies to help me innovate. And when I worked at small companies, I realized I really need the big companies to help me grow, right? So small needs big, big needs small. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that there's a magic around that. And, and there are many people that think, well, I can do my own tech priorities. I can, I can innovate myself and I can do it at, at company X. Mm -hmm. So uh, all three of you work for very significantly sized companies. I'd love to hear, how do you take startups like companies here? How, how do you help them? Do you embrace them? Do you have your own, right? What's your strategy for, for big, neat, small? Um, yeah. Jeff, you wanna go first? Um, so no, we, we absolutely need the external ecosystem community. Uh, we do make a lot of internal, we do have a lot of internal projects. I call them internal startups where we're building things to help our clients. Does but, it work? Uh, yeah, it works actually at a, at a pretty high clip. Um, our success rate is probably 80, 85%, maybe a little higher than it should be, meaning maybe we're a little too conservative. And this goes back to our advantage of we know what customers are, are paying for, so we, we don't always have to guess at what the market's going to be. Um, but that's also why startups uh, like working with us as well. So I think to give a specific example, we built a platform where we could plug in a bunch of the insure tech companies in the world. So uh, the pay per mile companies or pay per event insurance events. So if you think about that simplistically, what's going on is like the large insurance companies and their IT infrastructure were sort of not able to offer some of these more innovative type solutions because their tech architecture didn't allow for it. So what we did is we built a platform that allowed them to basically communicate with a whole series of startups and plug them into, say, a very large, I shouldn't name any of the clients, a very large insurance company that suddenly allowed one of your large insurance companies to offer pay per mile or pay per events insurance where their infrastructure didn't allow for that before. So we were that ecosystem layer, right, where we brought together the insure techs and we were helping them plug into lots of different insurance companies. We do the same thing with, uh, you talked about upskill, or I think, Laura, you might have mentioned upskilling people. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do it with about a dozen uh, 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 
upskilling uh, companies, right? So companies that do either the content training of all different sorts where we have a pool of these dozen companies, we have an infrastructure site, infrastructure layer on top, and then we're able to introduce them to frankly some of the largest companies in the world as a set. So it comes in as a solution. So that's how we do it. I would say that when I look at us over the last five or six years, we've probably done this more experimentally going to the outside world than we have before. But what we recognize is the power in that. So you're going to see us do a radical expansion of that over the next 18 months. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a tough question. Okay. And now you have the heads up because I'm gonna ask you both the same thing. Oh, geez, I, get to, I have to go first. Yeah, yeah, so you're on the spot. A lot of, there are a lot of startups here and they all wanna work with you. Yeah. And how do they do that? So, so when you pick something, it's, it's wonderful, but it's hard for small companies. How do they get your attention? Yeah, so what we're actually doing, uh, because we're thinking, of, so before we thought about it more ad hoc, right? So we had a more serendipitous way for startups for us to talk to each other. You know, we meet in the hallway, we talk, wow, that sounds interesting. What we're going to is a much more systematic way because we recognize we need to radically increase this program and globalize it. So we, we are build, I'm building a team right now to actually come and, and help you uh, attach to us as a firm, right? Help evaluate how do you attach, uh, how, how should you plug into our ecosystem? Which ones of our large enterprise clients would be interested in your product, which is actually good intelligence for you regardless of if we do that partnership or, or not. Um, how do we make sure if you are in our pipeline that we do connect you to the right, and I think for a lot of startups probably the right sales opportunities is what you're looking for. So we're, we're building the team to do that far more systematically than we have before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Clara. Okay, so at ServiceNow, I mean, it's absolutely, working with the ecosystem, working with smaller companies is absolutely critical to our strategy. It's been part of our core product and growth strategy from the very beginning. And ServiceNow doesn't have a history of buying big companies, but we have bought a lot of, a lot of smaller companies along the way. And, and the notion, and if you just think about um, like the expansiveness of where we've gone with this platform that we have, we started in IT service management into IT operations more broadly. Now we're in customer service, we're in risk and security, we're in um, supply chain, you know, we're in HR, we're now going into you know, ERP even more broadly. And so in all of these areas, there's, um, there's innovation and expertise that is beyond what we, you know, if, I talked earlier about this OPEX constrained environment that we're in as we're trying to drive growth and profitability in a balanced way. And there's only so much that we can innovate on our own and figure out where do we bring the expertise in, especially in these new areas that are kind of outside of the, the core of our core. And so, um, what you all do is incredibly important to kind of our growth strategy going forward. And so it, it's everything from we have a VC arm that invests early to stay close to companies and build relationships. Of course, there's M&A. We have go-to-market kind of related partnerships. We just have, you know, integrate technology integrations. Um, so there's a whole spectrum of that and, and you know, um, a system to kind of ensure that we can you know, scan those ecosystems, both from our corp dev group as well as from our, you know, BU. So, so that all exists and it's incredibly important. The other thing I would say that's an and, and it sort of relates to EY, is we have a really rich um, partner ecosystem at ServiceNow with, with folks like EY, but, you know, with thousands of partners out there. And we actually rely on them to drive innovation. We, we have, you know, EY has built a tax as a service um, you know, uh, offering based on, you know, that ServiceNow is a, is a critical kind of technology component. And that's not just one technology as they're building that, right? They're putting together the best technologies around their area of expertise, to often, you know, can, can be vertical, can, can be in a specific area of expertise. And so there's, that's a different angle for large companies like ours who do have a rich partner ecosystem, where they're putting together solutions to try to differentiate themselves in the marketplace. And they, you know, and so bringing those things together is another kind of entry point as you think about trying to build relationships and get some go-to-market momentum as you grow your business. Very good. So uh, we have a very active ventures arm that continuously sweeps for innovative startups. 
In fact, they're here today. Um, and so, so active in this, in this summit. And, um, and so we, as we have new businesses coming up and we're expanding our, our, our uh, business opportunities outside of, outside of mobile, uh, in automotive, in IoT, um, in XR, in PC, in, in tablet computing, all of those things, in AI, um, we continuously review companies that are, can give us the opportunity to work with them and allow our technology to help them grow or invest in them or even, even buy them. Uh, I'll, give you the, I'll give you examples. In, in, uh, in XR, we've bought four different companies so far, four, four different startups. Um, one of them specialized in hand tracking. So that's, you know, it's when you're in, in spatial computing, your input methods are not typing anything. It's your hands, your eyes, your head, your voice. So hand tracking becomes super important. Um, also holding a controller and having degrees of freedom. We, we bought, bought another company that, that does that. Uh, we bought an SDK company. So they send out software development kits to thousands of developers and we get feedback from those developers every six weeks. And so we, now, we also have another fund, it's called the Metaverse Fund, $100 million worth of it, that we find startups and we review it with our ventures group to put money into these, into these companies. As our business starts to grow, we find companies that actually can help us innovate and help um, figure out how we can expand our business and in, in turn help expand their business. And we have an investment in them as well. So, so there's, there's multiple multiples of that. And another, uh, another path that we go down is when we bring out a system solution chip-wise, people can't just take a chip and figure something out. So we build reference designs. These reference designs can either be cloud-based where you can access them through you know, a developer network, or we actually send out those devices to multiple ISVs that help us bridge between what our technology is and what a user experience can be at our customers. So we have all sorts of ways of interfacing to um, smaller startups and innovative companies, and one massive way is for us to be visible right here in mm -hmm. this summit. You know, it, it's, um, it's really interesting uh, to, to me to, to see still to this day how complicated it is for small companies to just get taken serious and get into yeah. that big ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, Mike Milken was talking yesterday and two things really stood out to me in, in, his, in his presentation at the opening. Uh, one of which is you need money. And he talked about needing money. He gave Chuck Dolan, who I'm very close with as an example and, and, and being close with the Dolan family, I, 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 I've watched that journey. And the second thing he talked about is data. And I do think that look at, at, at scrappy, amazing, innovative startups and they're, and, they, and they're doing fabulous things, but the data is held tight by the large companies. Yeah. And so it's held tight because, well, we're not gonna give it to a startup because that's our, that's our, our, our uh, crown jewels. And uh, so it has to be held by our own startups or our own internal innovation. And so I think that uh, my, my ask to everybody really is let's keep really, really focusing on helping uh, innovation and continuing to, to, to enable innovation. And, and I think there are partners programs, you know, I'm a big company, join my partner program, or I'm a big company, let me see if I wanna invest in you. And the hardest thing is how can I be a customer of yours, right? Yeah. That's still very, very, very difficult. So I think, uh, I think work to be done, at least from my perspective, I think it's the hardest for startups to say, well, I get it, but can you just buy my stuff, right? And can you help me sell, sell with, with other customers? And I think, uh, all three of your, your wonderful companies can help all of the startups here a lot with that. Um, I know that we're, we're almost out of time. We're supposed to end a quarter after, but I, I, um, I would love to know from, from each of you just as a takeaway, right? What is the one thing that you would say in terms of tech priorities, where it is we're going for investors and for uh, entrepreneurs? What's the, what's the takeaway? What's the takeaway? I'll go first, I guess. Uh, it's the benefit of sitting next to you, right? Um, so, uh, you know, what's really interesting is because you started with the idea that there's a pullback in the market, right, around technology because 
you can see the layoffs that are happening at larger companies. You see the valuations are, are down off their highs, although the highs are pretty good. So I, I don't feel too bad for the companies. Um, you know, what you, what you really see in these, in these tighter moments, though, is great invention happening, right? great innovation happening, great, great customer focus happening because everyone becomes much more intensive about how do you address that problem you're trying to solve and how do you do it as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Likewise, when we look at, at the large companies, at least the leading companies recognize that this is actually a moment to lean into the change, right? That the companies that lean in, is, and there's lots of studies around this. Uh, I like the, there's one I think by Gartner or something around that, which is, uh, is a leaning into the, into the curve, right? So when there is these times of great change, it's a time to double down and invest. And that's so, certainly something that we're looking and doing and making sure we're aggressively going after these new technologies that lead to new customer solutions. Um, this is the moment, if you're a large company, this is the moment to break away. If you're a small company, I think what the, all of us are recognizing and seeing is the change is happening so quickly that we don't really have the luxury, or sorry, I'll personalize this. We, why we don't have the luxury to build everything that we need to build on behalf of our clients, right? We do do some of it, but it's moving so fast that we, and that's why we're extending this program. It's we are becoming more reliant on being part of this ecosystem community. So as much as I think you hear about investments are down or valuations are down or layoffs are happening, this is a really wonderful moment to invent new things and be a part of that ecosystem and community, at least from us and I think probably from all of us. I love that statement. Yeah. I think that's right. When, when things are down, there's always an opportunity. Absolutely. Great comment. What do you think, Laura? Well, look, I, I think that, you know, this theme that's been running through here on customer experience is, is super important. Like, if you have customers, customer experience matters, right? And, and I get it. Like, it, it, things are harder now. It's harder than it was a year ago, than it was two years ago um, in technology. But I, 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 th I think we should all face this with incredible optimism because the reality is, Every single customer is still has still has the mandate for digital transformation. They absolutely have to have technology to get them to that next level, whether it's driving a differentiated business model, a different customer experience, a different employee experience. And so the folks in this room and what you know the companies represented here are enabling that digital transformation in a really powerful way. And the opportunity is to be incredibly focused by being incredibly customer centric on how you can help customers do that. And so I, I you know, I, I continue to have great optimism even in the face of a little bit of a different environment because the macro trends behind what technology can do for companies, for economies, et cetera, is so incredibly powerful and compelling. Yeah, and I, I, along exactly the same lines that you were saying, Laura, I think if you look at the semiconductor industry, there's headwinds. Um, you know, we've had slowdown of, of people buying equipment. Um, inventories have built up. Uh, but we see um, in the second half of 2023 and into 2024, all the inventory depleting and, and, a, and a new generation of devices coming out, a new generation of transformation. Regardless of those headwinds, digital transformation in multiple industries are happening now. And it's time to invest in that now before it becomes too late. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quote a, I think, I believe it's an IDC number, that by 2026, there's $3.6 trillion of spend on digital transformation across multiple industries. <clears throat> and so it's imperative to look at that um, and invest in that, and as well as figure out how on-device processing and on-device intelligence can bring new user experiences for that digital transformation, making everyone's lives easier and businesses to run a lot more efficiently than they are now. So I think that's the time to, this is the time to look at that and invest. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Alex, Laura, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. I, uh, I appreciate the, the very uh, succinct discussion, not just on the tech priorities and technologies, but on the context for each of them. And uh, clearly, the digital transformation continues. So uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.